Hey, take out the uh, green, green insert and open your Bibles, if you would, to Romans 12.1. This week in our Challenge 365 reading, which is we're going through the Bible as a church and, and reading together, and we came across a very, very famous passage of Scripture, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And so if you take a look at that, it says, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now, how many of you think you know what God's good and pleasing and perfect will is? Or are you existing on something less than God's best? It seems to me that across America, many believers today are living unhappily on spiritual lowlands, only slightly above the level of an unregenerate world, without enjoying the peace of God that passes understanding, without experiencing that joy, uh, that joy that is beyond what most people can experience, uh, without understanding the power of God that gives us victory over the world and the flesh and the devil. It seems to me that many are trying to be Christians in kind of a mild sort of way, vainly seeking happiness without holiness, contentment without commitment, and satisfaction without sacrifice, without experiencing the abundant and victorious life that Jesus died to give us and is is our birthright as children of God. In these verses... Paul talks about, he centers in on the transformed life, both both how it has begun and how it is maintained and sustained. And and he opens in verse 1 with the motive. And this is so important, the motive for the transformed life. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Now, notice, Paul didn't say, I command you. He could have done that as an apostle. And and certainly, the Greek word implies that this is imperative upon believers, that this is something God wants us to do. But he doesn't bark orders as an overlord. Authority is never more effective than when it's concealed in in a loving and compassionate appeal. And so he says, I urge you, when a gentle shepherd lovingly urges us and shows us the way by example, we will do marvelous things. And I think that's an important lesson for us to learn right off the bat about leadership and about interpersonal relationships. Even when we have the authority to command someone's obedience like Paul did, a loving entreaty, an urging, a pleading is often much more beneficial. When he starts that verse with and so, it's the same as therefore. It's kind of the hinge that connects all that follows with everything that's gone before. Okay, so if you look back on those first 11 chapters of Romans, you'll find one quality of God that just sticks out again and again. God's mercy, God's love and compassion and gentleness. And that's the primary motive for Christian living. The primary motive is not duty and discipline and determination It's the love of God. I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all that He has done for you. And that phrase, all that He's done for you, is one word in the Greek language. It's a word that's often translated mercy, but basically it's a word that kind of sums up all of the compassion and the tender mercies and the kindness and the gentleness and the care and the amazing grace that God has shown to us. Throughout Scripture... It is the love of God that motivates all that we do. The Bible says we love Him because, what? He first loved us. It's God's mercy and love seen in the way that He cares for us that motivates what we do. When we realize, when we really grasp how much God loves us, how graciously He has dealt with us, we're more than ready to respond to Him in loving and grateful submission. We sang that song a little bit ago. You know, you make all things work together for my good. Can you say that about anybody else? You know, you you who are parents, you want all things to work together for good for your children. You want that and you pray that, but you can't make that happen. 
because we don't have the power God has, but we have a Father who is omnipotent in His power, omniscient in His wisdom, and absolutely incredible in His love. And so He makes all things work together for our good. Paul put this motivation very succinctly in his second letter to the Corinthians. He says, for the love of Christ, and that means both his love for us and our corresponding love for him, the love of Christ controls us, motivates us, moves us. Having concluded this, that one, Jesus died for all, therefore all died. We died with him to sin, to self when we were buried with him in baptism. And thus we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him who died for us and rose again. How can we not live for him when he made the ultimate sacrifice for us? And so his love displayed on the cross motivates all that we do. David found that true even in the Old Testament as he sings to God, your right hand holds me and your gentleness has made me great. Some verses say your help or your care, your mercy, but whatever we call it, we're talking about God's loving kindness, God's grace that motivated David to greatness in God's sight. You've often heard me say that our problem is not that we don't love God. Our problem is that we don't realize how very much God loves us, how much He cares for us, because if we really understood that and grasped that, our love for Him We would be so filled with that love and gratitude to Him that there would be no problem in our lives surrendering anything and everything to Him. That's why Jesus could say, if you love me, you keep my commandments. That's not a warning. That's not a threat. That's simply the natural response of love. When we love someone because of all they've done for us, we will do whatever it takes to please them. After discussing then the motive for the transformed life, The description of the transformed life is what he takes up next. And every one of these descriptions, keep in mind, is simply a result of our response to his love and his grace and his mercy. First, he describes the transformed life as a life of sacrifice. In verse 1, he says, So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them, that is your bodies, be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he finds acceptable. This is truly, he says, the way to worship him. And I like the way Eugene Peterson paraphrases this in the message. He says, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping and eating and going to work and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Give yourself to Him. The whole expression here is a picture of the Jewish temple and the altar where the priests offered the animal sacrifices. God wants us to offer our bodies, and here the word simply means our whole self, our whole person. Offer that to Him. Self-preservation may be the the first law of of this life, you know, of nature. You know, we just naturally want to preserve ourselves. But self-sacrifice is the first response to His love in the transformed life. We want to give ourselves for Him who gave Himself for us. Paul used this same word in chapter 6. He says, "Do do not allow any part of your body become a tool of wickedness and used for sinning. Instead, give yourselves completely to God since you've been given new life. See, again, it's an expression of our love and our gratitude for what God has done for us. He's set us free. He's given us this new life. So use your whole body, he says, as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. The same members of our body that were formerly used to serve sin and self, our hands. Just think what you did with your hands to serve sin. Or the tongue, the things that you said, your feet, the, the, you know, all, of, all of your energies, your mind, your abilities, your desires that you used to use to serve sin, we now gratefully yield and dedicate to God. Total commitment. Abandoning everything. And yielding ourselves to God is the key to victorious living. A divided loyalty 
There's really no, no better than no loyalty at all. Paul says we are a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. Now, living is in contrast to those dead animal sacrifices that Blake talked about a while ago that they used on the altar. Our life is to be a living, a continual sacrifice as we deny ourselves and constantly put to death anything, anything in our lives that opposes God's will. All because of what He has done for us. It's not so much the sacrifice of things. It's the denial uh, uh, of various desires and habits and pleasures of the flesh that hold us back from pleasing God and reaching our potential as God's children in this world. It's willingly and joyfully giving up anything that may stand in our way of, of, of our relationship with Jesus. To be a living sacrifice means that Jesus and our relationship to Him and to His Word occupies the very top priority of our lives. Jesus sent, said it meant plucking out an eye or, or even cutting off an arm, a hand, if those things were keeping us from loving Him with a whole heart in practical experience. That may mean giving up certain recreational toys or activities like golf or camping or skiing or ATVing or uh, boating or mountain biking if those things are in any way keeping us from loving and pleasing Him. It doesn't matter how much we care about those things if we find that there's in any way they're keeping us from that adoration that we should have for Him, that, gra that gratitude, that love. It may mean giving up television or movies or, or the internet. It may mean breaking habits and uh, ending certain activities that are questionable. But again, none of this is a real sacrifice. That's what, that's what we need to see. None of this is a real sacrifice because of all that He has done for us. We're more than willing to surrender anything for the one who gave His all for us. Somebody said, now, the only problem with a living sacrifice, it keeps crawling off the altar. And I think we've all experienced that, probably more often than we care to admit. And that's why Paul uses a Greek verb tense here that means we are continually presenting ourselves to God. We don't present ourselves once and no more, but once and for all. We present ourselves to God. We did it when we gave our lives to Him and were baptized into Him. And we keep on presenting them day by day, moment by moment, all motivated by our love and gratitude for the tender mercies and loving kindness and grace that we've experienced from Him. Holy, He says. And holy means completely or fully separated from the profane, from the common, and totally dedicated to God. As He gave Himself fully for us, completely, we yield our whole selves to him that he can use us much as a surgeon uses his instruments you know the surgeon is skillful because his instruments lay yielded to his use conformed to his will and that's how God wants to use us the transformed life is the surrender of self until we have the mind of Christ it's the surrender of our mind and our will and our emotions to Him until we begin to see things from His perspective, to think His thoughts after Him, to feel His emotions with Him, and to purpose His will together with Him. The Old Testament priests were forget, forbidden to bring uh, bringing a sacrifice to God that was not the very best of the flock or the herd. Just as a half-dead lamb was not acceptable to God in the Old Covenant, so a half-hearted commitment is not acceptable to Him Today, it's all or nothing at all. Paul says it's only the total surrender, a uh, complete investment of our lives in God's service that is acceptable and pleasing to Him because that alone shows the love and the gratitude of our heart for all He's done for us. I think across America, the church has got it wrong. So many people want to give a tip to God. They want to, you know, they want to be fans. They're, they want to be enthusiastic admirers. They have warm, fuzzy feelings for Jesus, but they've not abandoned their lives to Him who gave His life for them. 
Speaking of service, Paul uh, causes Paul to affirm that this transformed life is not only a life of sacrifice, it's a life of service. He concludes b- verse 1 saying this wholehearted commitment to God is your reasonable service of worship. And that word reason- reasonable is logikos, from which we get our English word logical. Certainly our service to God as His purchased people who've been redeemed by His blood, the blood of His only Son, who've been set free by Christ's sacrifice, the only logical and appropriate response in light of all that He's done for us is to fall at His feet in commitment and surrender. The world scoffs. They they call a person a fool who dedicates their whole life in service for God. But in view of what God has done for us, in in, in consideration of what He is currently doing in our lives, and in light of what He shall yet do for us, is it not reasonable for a person to give up a life that he cannot keep, to gain a life that he can never lose? When we realize God's power and God's knowledge of the future and God's infinite love for us, the only reasonable and intelligent response is to entrust ourselves fully to His care, to trust Him completely. And to do all we can to live for Him, to serve Him, who's promised this to us. I will cause all things to work together for your good. Paul tells us that real worship is not merely the offering of prayers or performing some liturgy or going through some ritual. No matter how magnificent it might be, real worship is the everyday offering of our total selves to God in meaningful ministry. Touching and serving and loving others, making an eternal difference in their lives, allowing God to use us to be an influence and a significant influence in the lives of people around us. How how are are you letting Him use you to impact and influence your friends, your family, your children, those that you go to church with, those that you work with, those that you play with, those that you do business with. God wants to use us. And, 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 and that surrender is just one way we express our love and gratitude to Him. It's a life of sacrifice, a life of service. It's also a life of separation. Notice verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. It's so easy to become conformed to the world, to subtly get sucked into becoming just like our environment. The word Paul Paul uses here for world was not the Greek word for this earth. It was not even the Greek word for the people of this earth. It's usually translated age. And it's the same word used in Galatians where he speaks of this present evil age. And again in 1 Corinthians where Satan is described or it's 2 Corinthians, where Satan is described as the God of this age. Paul is speaking about conforming to all the floating mass of thoughts and opinions and philosophies and values and goals and behaviors and priorities that are prevalent in this world. And we've heard so much about in this last election, this last few months, those things that are opposed to God's will devastating to his people, destructive to us. John says it this way. He says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now you might be thinking, well, God so loved the world. But see, there it's a different world for world. Different word. It's the cosmos there. It's the world of people. God, we're to love people. But this age... The philosophies of this age. If anyone loves the world, the world's desires, the world's pleasures. He he, he explains it here. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world is passing away. That stuff is temporary. And also its lusts, all its desires. The desire for money, the desire for position, the desire for power the desire to have control. All that's passing away. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Our values must never, never be the seesaw standards of our society. 
but the will of God, because that never changes. The values of society change as fast as the weather in Colorado, and as a result, we live in an age of confusion. People don't know today what's right or wrong. You listen to some of those shows on TV, some of those talk shows. It's just a pooling of absolute ignorance concerning the will of God. Don't listen. Don't be politically correct. All right? Because almost all political correctness is a bunch of hogwash and a violation and a perversion of the will of God. But you see, there's some half-truths in there, and people tend to believe the half-truths. There's only one way to God. Jesus said it. I am the way. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's only one truth. I am the truth. And Christians believe that without an apology. We love everybody. But we believe what he says and we're on his side. It's no wonder with all the confusion in the world about moral values, God wants to keep us from conforming to society's standards. J.B. Phillips translates this verse, uh, verse 2. He says, don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. We must not fall in with the fleeting fashions of our contemporaries. He's talking about peer pressure. We fear it for our kids, but I think more adults fall into peer pressure than kids do. And more severe falling, greater problems. How often are we told in this world to be open-minded? Listen, Jesus and his apostles were not open-minded. They were open to God and to God's will. But they did never allowed the, the worldly society around them to dictate their faith and what they believed. Immorality. Immorality may be popular. It may be paraded and applauded. But it can never be voted proper by the majority. It doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. All that matters is that we play to please an audience of one. The psalmist said, How blessed is the person who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. God says, happy is the nonconformist. But how many Christians do just what the world is doing just because the world is doing it? And we don't want to be different. The problem is, holy, the word holy means different. God calls us to be holy as He is holy. He is different from the common other gods in this world. Just as we are to be different from the people around us. I think nothing probably turns us more into 20, 21st century conformers than the media of our day. Internet, television, movies, theater, music, advertising, magazines, books. I read all those. I use all those. I do all those. Watch all those. We see and hear these things, and we conform to their influence. It dull, they dull our sensitivity. They destroy our commitment to be different. And you just have to fight them. You have to fight back. You have to talk back. And if you're allowing yourself to hear more of the media of our culture than the media of God's Word, you're going to be at a severe disadvantage. And of course, we're going to talk about in just a minute. I think it'd be interesting to know how many Christians outwardly claim they're interested in knowing and doing God's will, yet they are hooked in some way or another by the continuous media bombardment that is designed to increase our appetite for sex and material possessions and sensual pleasures. Not that there's anything wrong with sex. I think sex is delightful. I think it's one of the, the most fun things on earth. There's nothing wrong with sensual pleasure. There's nothing wrong with material possessions within God's design for them. But we come to accept and approve and even participate in our culture's attitudes toward them. That's why Alexander Pope wrote a poem years ago. Do you know the word mean, M-I-E-N? It means appearance. So that way you'll understand this poem. Vice is a monster of such frightful mean. 
To be hated needs but to be seen, but seen too oft. Familiar with its face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And that's what's happened to so many people. We see it so often. We endure it. We don't fight it. We endure it. Then we pity it. Then we embrace it. And our values are going down the wrong way. Listen, we can love people. We can care about people no matter what they believe. But we have to stand for the truth. You need to understand the separation that God enjoins upon us is a spiritual separation. It's not physical. God has put us in this world to make a difference. He's put us in this world not to argue with people, but to serve them, to love them, to impact them with Jesus' love and with Jesus' truth. That doesn't mean that we're to go and hold placards up, that we're to have, you know, you know, signs up and do all kinds of things like that. We're to love people into the kingdom of God just like Jesus did. His last words before he ascended to heaven in Matthew were a commission sending us to infiltrate this world and share the good news of God's love and God's transforming power that people might be changed, that people might be set free and not drugged down by the, the, by the things of this world. But over and over he warns us that while we are in this world, we must not allow the world to be in us. We've got to maintain our spiritual and moral separation from the depravity and evil of the world in which we serve. Thoreau wrote it this way. He said, if I do not walk in step with others, it's because I hear a different drumbeat. And surely that ought to be true of the Christian more than any other. Why should we be in step with the tune played with the, by the world around us? We hear a different drumbeat. We hear the love of Jesus the marching orders of Christ, the celestial notes of eternal choirs, the sweet music of the Word of God. And that sets our steps toward heaven. This is not to say that we become some, some kind of oddball or that everybody avoids. The Bible says that true Christianity, like we see in Jesus, is an attractive thing, a winsome thing, a magnetic thing. You see how people were drawn to Jesus. You see how people were drawn to those early believers but we steer clear of the superficial value system of this world. Let's, let's keep in step with heaven's realities, God is saying, and not be conformed to temporal standards. And that's what he's getting at, Paul's getting at in verse 2. He says the transformed life is a life of sanctification. He says don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And the tense of the verb there is very significant for his Greek audience. It meant to keep on being transformed. We are transformed at our conversion. My life was changed as I came up out of that baptistry. Paul says that in Romans 6, 4, we die to self and sin and we're raised from that watery grave to walk in newness of life. But this metamorphosis is also to be a continual thing. Just as conformity is a constant temptation, so renewal is a constantly repeated experience. Paul's very specific. He says, transformed. It's from a Greek word that means the true nature, the inner essence of an object in contrast to just outward appearance. See, I think that's where the church has got it wrong. I think we're too concerned about outward appearances. Paul is, God and Paul here are not just talking about behavior modification, changing certain things on the outside. They're talking about the transformation of the entire person from the inside out. God changes not only our outward characteristics. You know, I, you become a Christian, then you start worshiping with God's people every Lord's Day. You start taking the Lord's Supper. You start giving. You start being generous. You start tithing. You start serving. You, you know, there's a lot of things you do that you can see outwardly. But all that has to be motivated by what God has done for us. His love, His grace, His mercy. Empowered by Him. He changes us from the inside out, in our inmost nature. The mistakes and the failures of our past need never defeat us and keep us from living a productive and joyful life in the future. There are a lot of people 
who have spent years going down the road, wrong road, sowing the wildest kind of oats. But one day they were brought face to face with the amazing love and mercy of God. They saw their sin, the dead end they were headed toward, and they repented, and they received God's forgiveness. And with His help, they began to put together a new life. You see, you can't, out, you can't undo the past. You can't change what you've done in the past, but by God's grace, you'll outlive it as He transforms you. 2 Corinthians 3.18 is a great, great commentary on this passage. It says, but we all, every believer, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. The mirror, James tells us, is God's Word. That's where we see Jesus' glory. And as we abide in His Word, the Holy Spirit within us, uh, we abide in His Word, the Holy Spirit works within us to transform us from the inside out into the very character and nature of Jesus. And this process takes a lifetime. We've got to be patient. That's why God says, I will continue to work in you until I'm finished with you. We live in this microwave age. We want everything in a hurry. We want everything instant, you know? And we carry this over into our spiritual lives. It takes time to be holy. Just as conformity with, to the world often comes through our exposure to worldly media and we are changed so gradually that we don't even recognize the change, so this transformation comes through exposure to media, the media of the Word of God. He says Trans, be transformed change by changing the way we think. Literally, it says, by continually renewing your mind. Now, how do you renew your mind in practical terms? How do we get these new attitudes, these new thought patterns uh, that characterize the transformed life? And there's only one answer to that. And it's what I mentioned a while ago. It's the Word of God. Jesus says we must abide in His Word, and His Word must abide in us. And that, that word for abide meant to make a place your permanent home. God's Word must be at home in our hearts. And we must be at home in God's Word. See, too often I think we're looking for flashing lights and ringing bells, some fantastic emotional whammy that God zaps on us all of a sudden. But usually God works on us in ways that are not highly emotional or crisis-oriented. The transformation takes place through the quiet, disciplined surrendering of our life every day to the Lord who through His Word and through His Spirit molds us into His image little by little from one degree of glory to another. So we're patient. We just keep at it. We allow the Word to, conform to, our, to, to cause our minds to be conformed to His truth rather than allowing the world to conform our minds to its falsehood. Being patient. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. That's why David, the psalmist, said, Your Word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. James says the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, the law that sets us free, God's Word, not having become a forgetful hearer but an effectual doer, that man shall be blessed in what he does. Earlier I read that psalm, blessed is the person who does not uh, follow the advice of wicked people, who does not take the path of sinners, who does not join the company of mockers. That's the negative but look at the positive. Rather, it says, he delights, next, he delights in the teachings of the Lord and reflects on his teachings day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams, a tree that produces fruit in season, whose leaf does not wither. You want to be one of God's evergreens? You want to succeed in whatever you do? Allow God's Word to abide in your heart and transform your life through the power of His Spirit. Look at the next steps on the connection card, if you would. I will think about all that God has done for me, how much He loves and cares about me, and allow that to draw out my love and gratitude to Him, motivating me to love Him more, obey Him, serve Him, sacrifice all for Him. Secondly, I refuse to allow the world around me to squeeze me into its mold. I'll keep my eyes wide open to the thoughts, ideas, values, and standards of the world around me, watching out for the subtle snares of the media. You can't avoid it, but you've got to watch out for it. Stand firm in God's truth. And thirdly, since the only 
only antidote for the world's influence on me is the influence of the Word. I'll make sure that I spend time daily in God's Word, renewing my mind and gaining God's perspective and reinforcing His truth. Fill those out. The worship hosts are going to come and collect those as we sing this closing song. God bless you.